Jar Jar is a key to all this. If we get Jar Jar working, because he's a funnier character than we've ever had in any of the movies before. Well. Encounter the worst character ever conceived in cinematic history. It's as if Roger Rabbit was redesigned by Satan. That character is just a tired stereotype. Everything that goes wrong in the following movies, you can totally blame on Jar Jar. You no know one, one wants to see Jar Jar Binks again. In fact, I'll tell you what's wrong. Have you guys seriously forgotten how fucking stupid Jar Jar Binks is? I may have gone too far in a few places. Hello there, I'm Valentino. And I don't know about you, but I do find Jar Jar rather interesting. So yeah, do I think Jar Jar is bad? Oh bloody hell, absolutely. But just because I think he's a bad character, that doesn't mean we can't learn from his mistakes that led to his creation, right? With that being said, in order to stand properly how something like Jar Jar came to be, let's go back in time and see why the first trilogy changed pop culture forever. <laughs> in the world of merchandising and marketing. <coughs> you see, way back when, there was a time when movies usually relied mostly on their ticket sales in order to turn out a profit. Weird, I know. Some merchandising was expected, but it never seemed to go too far for most films. When the first Star Wars film premiered back in 1977, it changed the way we saw science fiction forever. But it also changed what could be expected from a movie in terms of marketability. Hell, George only envisioned some R2-D2 mugs. Gotta take a whiz. So yeah, the market blew up in a sense. And people soon catched on to the possibilities really quick. Either good or bad. But now you may be asking yourself, but what does this all have to do with Jar Jar? Well, this didn't inspire his particular creation per se, but it did with his predecessor, and the ideas that will lead the way for his creation later on. Let's jump six years into the future, from 1977 to May 25th, 1983, when Return of the Jedi is released. Until now, Star Wars comic reliefs were being held to a pretty good standard, of both being funny and marketable. Well, it didn't last very long because these things showed up. The Ewoks. You see, the Ewoks were supposed to be the Wookiees, but George decided to scrap that idea because it turned out to be too complicated. So he decided to take the Minions approach and make the Ewoks cute, cheap, and most of all, marketable. And I mean cute, as in, if you think your idea of cute is a deformed bear with the physical body of a midget, human teeth, demon eyes, combined with the tactics of the freaking Viet Cong. But regardless, they were a hit with the kids. It spawned toys, a Saturday morning cartoon, and even two movies. People knew these things were crash grabs since the start, but at this point, it didn't really matter, because the main trilogy was finally over. And even with both companies and fans alike begging George to continue the franchise, George decided that he was not continuing the films. But then something happened. So after seeing the potential of CGI, George decided to announce in 1992 that the prequels were on their way, with him in the director's chair. So people were hyped. So he began working day and night, trying to bring his vision to life. But after the first drafts were made, he quickly realized, due to heavy exposition and focus on politics, the script was lacking any real comedy. You know, besides farts and aliens trying to kill enslaved kids and weird frogmen spitting in Oscar Schindler's face. Naturally, later on, he decided to insert a comic relief to do, well, what comic reliefs are supposed to do. Shift your focus momentarily to relieve the tension of a scene or moment. One that will both please the audiences as well as his friends in the toy factories and bring some fresh air into the franchise. And so the idea was conceived and Jar Jar was born inside of George's head. 
Which brings us to our first problem with him. Why was he made? There's no shame in being a comic relief character. Hell, they are usually the face of a franchise. But one of the reasons many people dislike the idea of a comic relief is not because they're meant to be funny. It's because many fall into the trap of being nothing more than a tool for the writer to use. Something with no real depth or real personality. With no real bearing on the story that just goes back into his toolbox every time he's no longer needed. There's nothing wrong with a character's main focus being comedy, but when they don't contribute anything of real value to the overall narrative, it makes them feel pointless and somewhat pandering. Because like so many other bad comic reliefs, the idea of him wasn't conceived as a character. He shows Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi the secret underwater city, and that's about it. He does nothing else to really justify his existence through the remainder of the film. And I know there are even more pointless characters in Star Wars than Jar Jar, but in all honesty, is that a really good bar to hold a character up to? So in a way, Jar Jar teaches us that if you want to add a character, though whatever you're doing, make sure it's a character and not at all. But because George was considered a genius, and Star Wars his sacred child, no one dared tell him it was such a bad idea to put so much pressure into one character. Therefore... Even though a character might feel somewhat pointless in the grand scheme of things, you have to remember, that doesn't mean they are bad. It just means they're not relevant to the main plot. And just because they don't seem to have a lot to do in every scene, that doesn't mean they can't get a laugh. I mean, everybody loves a good sidekick. But overexposure can easily kill even the best comic reliefs. You see, for me, a comic relief are pretty much like toppings on a dessert. If you use them sparingly and wisely, you'll be able to get that much needed extra flavour. But if you use them too much, it can easily ruin the balance. Sometimes movies make a bullshit excuse because they need to bring X annoying character for the rest of the journey because X reason. Or other times they say fuck it and it's just because the main character likes them so much, making it feel forced. You see what I did there? <laughs> But George didn't even give that luxury to Jar Jar. I mean, the whole reason for him being so much in the film was that he's helping Qui-Gon. But Qui-Gon doesn't even seem to like Jar Jar and still decides to bring him along. Because of this, mixed with Jar Jar's little impact to the story, these are the main factors that start to dig Jar Jar's grave even when he was nothing more than a name on a piece of paper. Now, unfortunately, I must make a confession to you all. Jar Jar is not cute. Actually, he's probably the opposite of that. Note that I said he's not cute. I'm not saying that he's a bad design, which in many respects, it's not. But the problem with the design is that it just simply doesn't work for his type of character. You see, cuteness has a science to it. Humans perceive things as cute mostly based on survival instincts of nurture in order to guarantee the survivability of a species. And this even applies to other things. This is called kind Kikima Hiroshima? This is called Kinderschema. And it's basically the traits and features that make us find things cute. You know. Big eyes, large forehead, small proportions, etc. And this is one of the reasons Jar Jar is not really cute. Because unlike the other Star Wars comic reliefs, he doesn't really have any of these traits. Small eyes, big mouth, big teeth. Creepy eyes. Big leathery floppy ears, etc. He is, in a sense, the compilation of things we are wired to do not find cute. Oh, thank you, Munchkin. And if you see his concept art, he looks less creepy by comparison. But remember, just because something looks good on paper, it won't necessarily translate well to other media. So I guess the lesson here is to use science to your advantage, in order to manipulate your viewers' basic psychology, to make something appealing for everyone. 
Oh, come on, don't look at me like that. Japan, Disney and porn do it all the time. Yeah, Jar Jar's voice ain't exactly honey, but why a character with a high-pitched voice like Donald Duck or a character with a very specific way of talking like Yoda mm, so good this sandwich is... are more bearable than Jar Jar? Well, for starters, it's the pitch. Now, the problem is not that he has a high-pitched voice. I mean, many characters and public speakers throughout history have had high-pitched voices. You see, the problem in this part is that Jar Jar's voice unintentionally fluctuates in pitch, something that humans don't find neither attractive or good. High-pitched voices can induce stress easier if people are not able to find a steady pace or constant, let's say, rhythm to it. Some say it's because it shows insecurity and unpredictability. Some others say it's because the brain could interpret it as either danger or the crying of a baby. But yes, Jar Jar's voice is all over the place. And even on top of that, Jar Jar's way of speaking doesn't really help in this case. I mean, Yoda talks in his own weird, close to English kind of way. But in a key difference here is that Yoda reorganizes the structure of his sentence, while Jar Jar has his own dialect. Jar Jar often uses variations of words to which some meanings could not always be clear to everyone. And on top of that, Jar Jar makes sounds constantly while he's talking, making him even harder to understand, in the same spirit of when you're trying to talk to someone over really loud music. Here, take this. What's in here? It's a magical bag of winds. Jar Jar deviates greatly from other Star Wars comic reliefs, in the sense that, while the others rely more on quick banter or initial sarcasm, Jar Jar relies more on accidental physical comedy, a form of comedy that's easy to sell to children, and often relies on the misfortune produced either by the clumsiness, obliviousness, or just sheer old bad luck the character has. Again, not an awful idea, but combined with Jar Jar's little presence on the main plot, and the fact that he's not needed in most of the scenes he's in, like we previously mentioned, his incompetence makes him look more like a detriment to both the story and the characters around him. But that doesn't matter if he's actually funny, right? And even though comedy is subjective, Jar Jar isn't really funny. You see, Jar Jar is based on the performances of Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, and the king of animated physical comedy, Goofy. Yes, you can tell those three things gel perfectly together in a Star Wars movie. And with Jar Jar being the first fully computer-generated character in a live-action film, which is total bullcrap, by the way, it would make sense for the creators to draw inspiration from their routines. So if Jar Jar is based around them, shouldn't he just be as good? Well, the answer can be summed up in just two clips. I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. Everybody knows you never go full retard. Jar Jar failed because George and his team failed themselves. When it came to understanding what made this comedy special, it's far more complicated than just funny faces, fools, and weird movements. Like any form of comedy, it depends on many factors. One, for example, being relatable mostly expressed through overstatements from mundane situations or settings the viewer might be familiar with. You see, we understand the setting and the ideas or actions that lead to a character in this situation, because chances are the viewer has experienced something similar at some point in their life. So yes, physical comedy relies on exaggeration, that's true, something that Jar Jar does all the time. But there's also a line that a performer must not cross in order for his role to be taken seriously even in its own ridiculousness. The fine line between using overstatements and an egregious performance. And by this, I mean trying too hard to go over the tone of the film just to get a laugh, to the point the audience gets turned off and taken out of the experience. Understanding this is what makes the difference between a master of physical comedy and a bad circus clown. There is a certain dignity and relatability in these performances that allow us to wear the character's shoes and feel their pain. 
understanding their reasonings and comprehend a struggle that feels somewhat genuine to us. And because Jar Jar doesn't exhibit any of those traits, it's harder for us to relate to him. We just see a bumbling, screaming mess failing to get a laugh, so it immediately pulls us away from him. He tries to be cute, but his design doesn't allow it. He tries to be funny, but his lack of grace holds him back. So if you look at it from this way, yes, Jar Jar did exactly what he set out to do. He was a comic relief who was meant to become a staple of the franchise. However, due to his negativity and all of these problems, the fans simply turned on him. And yes, he did become a staple of the franchise, but a staple of hatred. But you may be saying now, but what about the films themselves? Isn't there a moral to be learned? Well, technically, yes. Jar Jar, like many other things, is supposed to mirror some elements of the original trilogy, with his closest counterpart being Yoda. So yes, don't be mean to those who might find annoying or below us because they can help in the future. Help can come from unexpected places. People make bad decisions based on good intentions, yada yada yada. But even that's not entirely true because there are even better examples of this throughout the saga. So what now? Jar Jar seems pointless from beginning to end. Is there nothing original he can teach us at all? Well. Maybe. You see, when the immense backlash of the movie started, George told the actor who played Jar Jar, Ahmed Best, that he will see a form of reverse in how the character is viewed. We already know how George knew this. And he was right. The kids who grew up with Jar Jar have fond memories of him. And the prequels nowadays have become a meme, and we also know why Jar Jar may feel odd to an adult. However, this only helps theories like Darth Jar Jar to become even more believable. Like we said, because his act feels disingenuine, we don't buy his clumsiness, and we're able to suspect that something else is going on behind what seems to be a facade to disguise something darker, a tactic commonly used by social predators. However, unfortunately due to all of the backlash, we'll never truly know what Jar Jar's main intentions were. So yeah, in a way, Jar Jar is finally doing what he is supposed to do. Bring happiness to people. Meaning that even if your work is not appreciated at first, it doesn't mean people won't enjoy it in the future. But that could also be said for the prequels and the holiday special as well. Ah, fuck. Jar Jar is even more pointless than I thought. Hell, you may even think that I hate him at this point, but in all honesty, I don't. Quite on the contrary, I identify him with him a lot. Not because I like him, but because I know how it feels to just want to make people laugh and failing miserably. We all know that feeling of telling a joke that's followed by that awkward silence. Those looks from people when we try to act silly with a child. People telling us to just grow up. But Jar Jar, no matter what, just smiles and continues to move on. The other characters have their moments to shine, but he doesn't. And regardless, he's always there for his friends, no matter how annoying they tell him he is. And he always tries to do what he believes is the right thing to do. So I guess he can teach us that no matter how silly some people might think you are, or how bad you screw up, that doesn't matter. You're no less than a person, as long as your heart is in the right place. So even if Jar Jar is not a good character, at the end of the day, he can still teach us a couple of valuable things. You're so fine dressed, Senator. Those and with good in their heart, always passing too soon. I've been Valentino, and welcome to Buried Entertainment. See you soon! Well, I know